Jobless corps, no work in the factories, no more manufacturing. All the tools are broken, rusted, every wheel and window busted. Through the city streets we go, idle as a CEO, idle as a CEO. Well, one, two, three, four, join the marching jobless corps. We don't have to pay no rent, sleeping in a camping tent, dumpster diving. Take money, every bite we share with 20. Let the yuppies have their wine. Bread and water suit us fine. Bread and water suit us fine. Well, one, two, three, four. Join the marching jobless corps. Worked and paid our union dues. What did years of that produce? Houses, cars, and other shit. For the richest benefit. What do workers get for pay? Hungry, broken. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today, uh, both on YouTube and here live on Zoom. We are very excited for today's program. So to open with some remarks, Dr. Mark Kligman, director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience here at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. Oh, Mark, you're muted. <laughs> oh, um, okay, maybe we need to unmute you. <laughs> One moment.
Hello, thank you all for joining us. It's so good to be here and we look forward to a truly, truly wonderful program. My big thanks to everyone who's really helped to make today's event possible, a more formal introduction and thanks will be given by our Associate Director, uh, Dr. Lori Black. But it gives me great pleasure to welcome Cantor Neil Michaels of Temple Israel of West Bloomfield, Michigan. We're so glad that we're able to partner with you on this event. Look forward to other programs and with no further ado, Cantor Neil Michaels. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And um, on behalf of Temple Israel, I'm so thrilled to be here, uh, you know, representing not only our temple, but uh, all of our wonderful members and uh, people from the general Detroit community. Uh, we are thrilled to, to have you here with us and are so excited for this opportunity to partner with UCLA uh, and the, the Milken Center for Music. Um, and most especially because uh, it features uh, the amazing, incomparable Daniel Kahn, who uh, we are proud um, to, to celebrate uh, his music uh, today and his uh, connection, of course, to Detroit. Uh, and I just wanted to share maybe one brief memory of Daniel, which I hope doesn't embarrass him too much. But uh, in the summer, we do these beautiful Shabbatot outside by our, our pond, uh, overlooking the pond. And for the whole community, a thousand pe people will come out. And uh, we had the pleasure of having Daniel for one of these services. And I, I just remember the sun sort of setting in the background behind him. He had a you know, accordion on one arm, a ukulele in the other, you know, uh, harmonica strapped to his neck and maybe like cymbals in between his knees. You know, with the sun setting in the background, he began to sing this song that, you know, immediately kind of penetrated our souls. And there was a, such an aura around him, uh, you know, of the, sun, of the sun going down and his beautiful music making. Uh, and I, and it's a sort of an indelible image kind of Im implanted in my, my brain. Um, so, uh, so thrilled to, to hear some of his music again today and uh, to again be a partner in this with, with all of you. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our host for today, uh, Dr. Lori Black, Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music, the American Jewish Experience at UCLA. And uh, thanks again to you and Beth, Lori. Thank you so much. Um, it really is wonderful to have, you know, these partners come together and be able to create something that's greater than some of its parts and partnering with community organizations and synagogues is, is something very special. So uh, thank you again for being a part of this, uh, Cantor Michaels and, and Ellie and Temple Israel. So uh, hello and welcome to the Jewish Music Masterclass series produced by the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. We are thrilled to have you join us for music and conversation with our guest, the Yiddish troubadour, Daniel Kahn. To make sure that you know about all of our programming related to music of the American Jewish experience, please make sure you're on our email list. You'll find the link uh, in the mailing uh, for the mailing list in the chat or simply do what I do and Google UCLA Jewish music and you will be the first thing that pops up. Um, our next, we have several really interesting programs coming up in the near future. Uh, on February 21st at 11 a.m., we will be hosting a book talk uh, uh, with the author Ruthie Abelievich, and the book is entitled Possessed Voices, Oral Remains from Modernist Hebrew Theater. And this is an opportunity to both hear about the program and um, directly interact with the scholar and learn more about what went into it. On February 23rd at 5 p.m. Uh, PST, uh, we will be featuring a program with Zalman Molotek, music director of the Volksbühne and the mu also one of the masterminds behind the creation of the Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof. And he will be taking us through what went into the creation of Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof. Forgive me. And so with that, I would like to tell you just a little bit about our performer today. And unfortunately, my window just closed. <laughs> One moment, please. Forgive me. Here we go. Um, 
And I should also, I for, forgive me, I forgot to mention that our Jewish Music Masterclass series has another install, uh, has another uh, in the series on March 2nd at 5 p.m. featuring the great klezmer clarinetist David Krakauer. So now Daniel Kahn, a founding mem member of the Painted Bird, the Brothers Nazaroff, Zemmer Ensemble, the Lot Blues, his duo with Soy Kurilenko, the International, has recently released the third and fourth International, two collections of revolutionary and apocalyptic mischief songs. As a theater artist, he works frequently at Berlin's Gorky Theater, originated the role of Perchik in the hit Volksbühne production of Fiddler on the Roof, played Biff in New Yiddish Rep's acclaimed Death of a Salesman, and was featured in From Shtetl to Stage in Carnegie Hall. His critical and poetic writing has appeared in such publications as Jewish Quarterly, Die Zeit, A Simptot, and Sim uh, Smithsonian Folkways. Academic presentations and performances include Oxford's The Art of Cultural Translation, uh, UI Chicago's Doikite, Diaspora, and Borderlands, and the upcoming Yiddish in Translation in Paris. If anyone is interested in working with Daniel Kahn, um, be sure to look into his songwriting workshop, exploring Yiddish songs in various ways, both translation um, and, and adaptation uh, through the Workers Circle starting at the end of the month. And that can be found at circle.org. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce Daniel Kahn. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's from so far away, but... Uh... Yeah, it's thank you so much for having me and for everyone who's joining the session. And thank you, uh, Neil, for what you said. I remember that that uh, Shabbos very, very well, and it was a it was a beautiful time. It actually made me want to play that song. I think that you were thinking of that I that I played there. <laughs> I can play a little bit of it just so you'll know what 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 uh, Neil Michaels was talking about. It was actually Loria was the song that you wanted me to play. Nid such mich wo, hiv mir et grinen, gefinst mich dort nit mein Schatz. Du ladens welten bei Maschinen, dort nis mein Ruheplatz, dort nis mein Ruheplatz. Don't look for me in nature's greenery. You will not find me there, I fear, where lives are wasted by machinery. That is where I rest, my dear. Don't look for me where birds are singing and chanting songs find not my ear. For in my slavery, chains are ringing. Yes, the music I do hear. Nor leaps to me. Nor leaps to me. Mit wahre Liebe, to kum zu mir, mein guter Schatz. Und heiter auf dein Herz, du Strebe, und mach mir sie's, mein Ruheplatz, und mach mir sie's, mein Ruheplatz. So, yeah, so that was a, a song called Mein Ruheplatz. It's a fairly well known American. Uh, Yiddish song written by uh, Morris Rosenfeld um, about 106 years ago. And it was one of the first Yiddish songs I ever really learned or translated. So, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Daniel. Um, you couldn't have set me up more brilliantly for <laughs> some of the questions I have. But, um, you know, that song really, one of the things that, you know, why it speaks to my Neshama and and why I imagine to some degree it speaks to yours and and more uh, you know more largely to what you do, um, is your music really represents a connection between modernity and the past. You know this meeting of like what 
what we what we do now in in Yiddishkeit and what was Yiddishkeit. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how, where your deep connection to the Yiddish world comes from, and and how in a song like that how you make those connections. Well, thanks for asking that. Um, my my engagement with Yiddish started relatively late in my life. Um, I grew up, as Neil pointed out, in the Detroit area, going to Temple Israel. I had a Jewish education. I was bar mitzvahed there. I became involved actively in the local uh, professional theater community when I was still young, um, working a lot at the Jewish Ensemble Theater, headed by um, uh, Evelyn Orbach, Olia Sholem. Um, and so I had a sense of Jewishness as a as a cultural identity, um, as well as a religious or, or ethnic or historical identity. Um, but the Yiddish language, Yiddish music, Yiddish song, uh, Yiddish culture uh, was not a part of that education. And so I, when I discovered these great songs, these songs which even though they're 100 years old, um, some of them, I consider them thoroughly modern. Um, I consider them completely contemporary and relevant. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in the past per se, um, only insofar as the past is not past. Uh, um, the, to paraphrase uh, William Faulkner, I guess. Um, the, uh, in Yiddish, you would say Fagangen, Fagangenheit. Um, a great Yiddish poet uh, of Ram Sutzkever called it the Fergangen Kate, which was a kind of uh, neologism, uh, uh, mixing in the word of past and chain. Um, we are chained to the past. The past is present. Um, and I think if we are to understand anything about our world today, and if we are to have any kind of hope for the future, then we need to understand the ways in which the past is not past. And so I find songs that speak to me because of their relevance to the world today. This song, Manurua Plots, which is a, a very, on its surface a very lovely love song, is actually a song of deep and passionate protest against industrial exploitation and capitalism. Um, it's a sweatshop song um, about the kinds of modern wage slavery which, uh, well, built up the the ascendant American economy in the early part of the 20th century. And um, one need not do much interpretation to understand the ways in which the world economy today uh, is supported by um, a global system of exploitation. Um, we talk today about essential workers uh, and uh, the heroism of essential workers in this pandemic. A friend of mine in Canada said, I think we need to reevaluate our definition of the word heroic because it seems to be, what it, the way it's being used these days is it seems to mean willing to die without complaint. Um, we put people at risk uh, because we don't want to change our lifestyle and inconvenience ourselves. Um, and we are literally sacrificing human lives on the altar of the economy. So a song from 100 years ago that speaks to these themes doesn't strike me as anything less, any bit less modern than something that we would write today. Absolutely. I mean, it very clearly, I, I, as, as you said, you don't have to work too hard to think where, where those connections are. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, well, th there was a question as to how you learned Yiddish, and I know that's always a question for, for individuals. Why is someone learning Yiddish in the 21st century? Um, but I mean, it, you, you already spoke to it a little bit, that, that Yiddish, uh, it, as with these songs, is, is alive. these are alive and well. These are living, breathing things, but maybe you can expound on that a little. Well, I, I, maybe it's a little backwards the way I came to the Yiddish language as a language. You know, I fell in love with the music. I fell in love with the songs. I started singing the songs. I started translating them. And then I really was kindly told by some of my mentors and uh, colleagues and friends, I need to really learn the language. Um, and I 
was learning Yiddish more or less at the same time that I was learning German. I moved to Berlin in 2005. I had already started singing Yiddish songs by then, but to really take it seriously as a language, I started learning it in those next couple of years. Um, I had very good teachers, Pesach Fishman, all of Sholem, wonderful singers who uh, taught me a lot. Michael Alpert, no relation to Herb, unfortunately, but a, a dear, dear friend and, and mentor of mine. Um, Adrian Cooper, Ali uh, Asholm. And uh, I, in 2008, it was the first time I took a real serious course. I went to uh, the YIVO summer program in New York, and uh, that was when I really learned Yiddish as a language, and I'm still learning it. I would never claim to be a fluent Yiddish speaker. Um, the idiomatic depth of Yiddish is so deep, I will spend the rest of my life trying to swim across that ocean. <laughs> as, as, as a friend of mine said, I didn't grow up with Yiddish, but I'll grow old with it. I might steal that phrase from you. Um, well, I think this is a great time to transition to another song. Well, yeah, here's, uh, I guess I'll dive into some of the darker stuff. <laughs> so this song was one of the first songs I wrote when I formed the band The Painted Bird in Berlin. It's the title track of the first record that we did in 2006. And I think the song kind of grapples with these questions. Why Yiddish? What does it mean? What, what do I have to dig through? What does it mean to me? Um, what are the questions that, that, this, that this language raises um, in me? So uh, this is a song called The Broken Tongue. You hear okay? It's all right. Are there any Yiddish songbooks? Yes, there are excellent ones edited by the amazing parents of Zalman Molotek, whom we will be meeting. Uh, there, those are the, that's the canon, the, uh, the three songbooks published by the Worker's Circle. Mirtrogen uh, Gazang, Pearls of Yiddish Song, and Songs of Generations. There are lots of other books. You can see this is my whole Yiddish songbook section. <clears throat> but this one didn't exist until I wrote it. And there's one line of it in, in Yiddish. Now you who gather joyfully beneath the festival lights and warm each other soulfully with all of your delight, take not too much comfort in this song. For what you choose to elevate from what was cast below Is but the tidal whimsy of the seas you do not know And may well turn asunder before long A beauteous sound, a diamond I had found A diamond I have found beneath the snow Buried in the ground, neath a ruddy mound Neath a ruddy mound where nothing grows well, the guests are almost ready for the dancing to begin. They've come to toast the wedding between Zion and Berlin. So raise a glass up to the bride and groom. But don't confuse the Deutsch with Yiddish, nor the night with day. And if a Kaddish sounds like Kiddish, bow your head and pray. We never step upon the glass too soon. A shame, Gesang. An oitzer for a clang, an oitzer for a clang, wie für a chuppe. Zerspalten von a schwer, magrobben tief in der Erd, magrobben tief in der Erd und her der Kuppe. broken melodies to songs in broken tongues cannot erase the memory of bells already rung nor can it unring the ones we hear so let the broken birds return upon their painted wings let the broken words be burned unto the songs we sing for not a note is new unto our ear a shame gesang an oitzer for a clang, an oitzer for a clang, wie von a chuppe. Zerspalten von a schwer, 
Magrom tief in drer, Magrom tief in drer, don't er der Kuppel. Beauty a sound, a diamond I have found, a diamond I have found beneath the snow. Buried in the ground, neath a ruddy mound, neath a ruddy mound, where nothing grows. So it's been a while since I played that one, if you can't tell. Uh, but I thought it was um, fitting somehow to the question. Uh, Absolutely. Would you mind uh, telling us just a, a bit more about that tune, uh, what the text means a little bit for us? Because, I, I mean, forgive me, my Yiddish isn't great, uh, but the English it itself is, is a pretty fascinating text. It tells an interesting story. Well, uh, th I think uh, that song came to me when I was at some klezmer concert in berlin and the very first months of me living here and being struck by this a little overly joyous air i was you know it was i think a lot of uh, american jews can relate when they first come here you get kind of slammed in the face with history uh, and with all of the the history that we that we know about about europe and and um jewish history here and so um, it was a critical look at the kinds of ways in which Jewish culture was so popular, so celebrated, so, uh, so um, sometimes superficially celebrated here. Um, and uh, it was a little bit of a pushback against that, you know, saying, OK, let's let's not dance at this wedding yet. Let's not break the glass yet. Don't confuse the Deutsch with Yiddish, nor the night with day. And if a Kaddish sounds like Kiddish, bow your head and pray. We never step upon the glass too soon. Um, and this was a critical feeling that I had not only about attitudes coming from a non-Jewish perspective, but from a Jewish perspective as well. Um, and bear in mind, I've lived here for 16 years now, and this was from the first months of living here. Um, so I think I have a little more nuanced feeling about it now, but... Uh, just today, my wife, Yeva, went, she had a dentist appointment early in the morning, and she, she was walking back uh, home, and she sent me a, a photograph from the church just down the block. And there's, I'll try to translate this in my head, but it basically said something like, um, Judaism and Christianity, closer than you think. And then it said, Purim, question mark, carnival, question mark. And then it said, it had this little text saying like, Purim, the Jewish holiday celebrating a time when Jews were saved from, 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 from a state pogrom genocide. Uh, and it celebrates this every year. And then Carnival, a time before Lent when all the moral, you know, like rules of, of Christian society are turned on their head. And I thought, and then it's sort of like equating these two things and there's, there's a, and I thought, what, excuse me, what a bunch of bullshit, you know, <laughs> I mean, this, this is such tone deaf bullshit. And then I went on the website, um, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's hashtag Beziehungsweise, which means uh, they're trying to make a play on words, Beziehungsweise literally would mean um, uh, relatively it relate it's relatively or, or uh um it means many different things actually but what it means is like try the play on words they're trying to create is it has to do with building the relationship between jewry and christendom or whatever and uh but you you also it also could mean you know Jew judaism beziehungsweise christianity it could mean that judaism meaning christianity it's a very weird equation and uh, sure enough, this program was also supported by the Central Council of Jews in Germany. Um, so this is a, a two-way road of uh, oversimplifying things. And um, I, it really turned me off. You know, it, that, it's really interesting. And I, 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 I mean, I, I, I have very limited time in Germany, but I, I, it, it is kind of an interesting, it, it is interesting how Jewish culture is expressed in a very different way from United States, and it is celebrated in a very different way. 
Um, I wonder, because you've been there so long and you've kind of been at the heart of what the, the, the Yiddish resurgence, uh, Klezmer revival, what have you, in Berlin has been, I wonder if you could speak to what you think, what, why you think Berlin is a heart of this, one, one of the hubs. Well, okay. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, I've gotten it for years going back and forth to the States. And, you know, I totally understand this. I see that uh, some folks here have asked, why Germany? Why Berlin? Um, there are, the, so the short answer is, I, I moved to Berlin and I stayed so long in Berlin because I really love this city. It's a wonderful city. It's a world city. It was an affordable city when I moved here. Um, and the ability to live as an artist in a city that doesn't require you to be rich and come from a lot of money um, is uh, a real blessing, which I was not able to find in the major cities of the United States uh, when I lived there. So it was a place, it was a space where I could explore myself and my work as an artist without needing to do something that I didn't want to do for a living. Um, and I was able to build up a career here as a musician and as a theater artist that um, was continually surprising and interesting to me. Um, nevertheless, I'm not ignorant of, of the ironies and difficult questions that come up by uh, being a, an artist in Germany, exploring very publicly um, different modes of Jewishness and Jewish history and Jewish identity. Um, having said that, Berlin is one of the largest Jewish cities in Europe. There are tens of thousands of Jews in this city alone, and over 100,000, if not more than that, in Germany. Um, and these aren't all, I mean, a lot of them came from the former Soviet Union, a lot of folks came from Israel, a lot of folks came from the US, from other places. Um, this is, there is a vibrant and diverse collection of Jewish cultures in this town. And um, I have a community here of folks who I collaborate with on theater projects and music projects. Um, and I feel truly at home here. Uh, and not all of those people are Jews. Um, this culture, this musical culture, and this, this linguistic culture and this Yiddish culture is a world culture. And that means that uh, it is open to contributions and collaborations and, 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 uh, and I have to say some of the most uh, deep, creative, inventive, uh, brilliant, and open menschlich Yiddishists that I know and Jewish Yiddish musicians are non-Jews. Uh, and that's not only true here, that's also true in New York, it's true in Montreal, it's true in California. Um, this is a world culture. Um, and, you know, I grew up in Detroit where the music that, that still speaks most directly to my soul is African-American music. Um, and I love rock and roll, I love jazz, I love hip hop, I love uh, soul music. And um, by no means, I mean, there were certainly a lot of white people involved in making, producing, and creating those musics, uh, although it is African-American music. And I don't want to draw a fence around cultures. I think that cultures thrive best on their edges, on their points of exchange, on their borderlands. Um, Yiddish itself is a language that always existed in, in tension with, in, 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 in contact with, uh, in, in neighborhood with other cultures and languages. Um, and that's one of the things that turns me on about it. And so Berlin itself is a meeting place. I met my wife in Berlin. She came here as part of a Russian or Soviet Jewish family in the 1990s. I work with so many folks from the Middle East, from North Africa, from the former Soviet Union, from Eastern Europe. Um, and quite honestly, I don't think I would have encountered any of them had I stayed in the U.S. This is a meeting ground, and I, I value that. That's amazing. Well, um, with that, do you want to go ahead and move on to your next tune? Sure. Uh, what, what was it? Oh, yeah, okay. So here's a... This is a song that I wrote here some years later. Uh, and it's another song about moving around and that asks some questions. Prepare yourself 
to swallow all your diamonds and your rings and all your ticky shiny windy things don't scare yourself the photos in the newspapers are blurred the radio is broadcasting a word beware yourself the neighbors aren't neighbors anymore they're leaning with a glass against your door Take care of yourself and hoist into the air your disbelief. Just go ahead and give yourself relief. Get ready for your inner immigration. Get ready to be alien inside. Consider all your social obligations. The borders are your foreign order bride. You won't ever have to leave your nation. You won't ever have to even try. Just make a secret inner immigration. And you won't ever have to say goodbye. Well, Hanna was at home in the Berlin cabarets of 32. But in 33, the weather turned and the brown shirts all turned loose. And the rumors, they were bad. Her Sotsi lover, Alex, was getting scared. You see, his name was on a list for having red friends and brown hair. And he wanted to get out. Hanna could have gone with him to his family in Ukraine. But instead, she took a walk out in the rain. Through her Berlin, she thought about how this weather, it'll pass. Anyway, things had always worked out in the past. So she made a kind of inner emigration. She started to feel alien inside. With all the social marginalization, her sense of place was starting to be tried. But she couldn't stand abandoning her nation. She didn't want it all to pass her by. So people make their inner emigrations. So one by one they have to say goodbye. Well, Sasha had heard about the immigration, and the talk wasn't just in the family anymore. In the Kharkiv streets, there was a kind of thaw. We're going home, said old Saminsky when he filed his application to leave, and his Anya already had family in Tel Aviv. But Sasha wasn't sure. Two hundred years among Slavs being called Hebrews, he knew they'd only be called Russians among Jews. And on the Prospect Lenin Avtobus, he heard that Saminsky had lost his apartment was being denied his pass. And anyway, this weather seemed like it was never going to pass. So he chose to make an inner emigration. He chose to keep his alien inside. With all the bureaucratic frustrations, he chose to keep his status bona fide. And what's the bother? Finding a new nation. A border isn't art, it's just a frame. So people make their inner emigrations. Because the holy land and exile are the same. Well, Anat was a Sabra. She was the daughter of a Sephardic kibbutznik nurse and a Yaki lawyer from Bonn. She fell in love with Kais, born in a PLO refugee camp in southern Lebanon. They were married in Cyprus. He almost got arrested living with her family in Ramat Gan, so she tried serving coffee at his family in Hebron. That didn't work either. She thought about leaving to live with her cousin David in Michigan. But he wanted to be able to marry his boyfriend Patrick, so they were moving to Berlin. So she went to the Jaffa beach and she stared at the sea and she thought about how someday all of this might pass. But until then, she needed to find some way to make Kais pass. So should she make an inner emigration? Tell me what you think she should decide. Considering the couple's situation, She'd be better off as someone else's bride. But she and he comprise a kind of nation, the kind we build inside when we're alone. But if these two just make inner emigrations, then they'll only have a home when they're at home. Now compare yourself. What does all this have to do with you? How does your experience ring true? You're aware yourself. Are you really suffering anyone's regime? Aren't you free to follow every little dream? Be fair to yourself. You needn't feel oppressed to be alone. You don't have to be driven from your home to spare yourself from feeling like a part of the control with an internal diplomatic role. Get ready for your inner emigration. It's a kind of shift accomplished easily. 
<laughs> Just make a kind of inner emigration. It's a kind of... It's kind of shift of this easily. We all have made our disassociations, whether on the job or in our families. And what's the bother finding on... And what could be more irrelevant than nations? Where everywhere you go, it's buy or sell. But if we all make only inner emigrations, then everything will only go to hell. <laughs> yeah, there's a mouthful. I, uh, yeah, thank you. I could have used the lyrics for that song if anyone wants to do them before, before I started singing it. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a monster a, a, of a song. It's a, um, long, it's a long road, that song. It's a, it's a long walk up a short question. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there is no, I, I, in my opinion, the song deals with like the core question of this entire masterclass, which is, connections of you know one's jewish identity to one's art artistic uh creation and i mean the the navigation of jewish identity as you alluded to in our, our in the conversation before the song um you know this idea uh, of borders meeting is, is one that it, it just it, it is so um ubiquitous with the jewish experience but this song really talks about well it's even more complicated than that that jewish identity is constantly being navigated it's it's one that you know it, it is changing i i would even say you know in a in a time when you know we're we're exploring what does it mean to be jewish what does it mean you know what is whiteness and and what does it mean to be some a person of color all the all these different complicated issues this song really um touches on it and and one thing that really i found quite interesting is how um you know, and I guess this comes also from the experience of being in, in the Klezmer and Yiddish world is that it tends to be a place for people who don't necessarily don't always feel comfortable in main parts of Ju of the Jewish experience. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, and I, I know I'm, <laughs> this, is, I'm, this is a lot, but I, I'm curious if you could just tell us a little bit more about, you know, what went into the creation of the song. Are, are these real stories that you're telling or, you know, how did you conceive of them? um one of them the, actually one of them is based on some friends of mine i won't say well it, it's obviously the the fourth verse the 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 palestinian israeli couple um is loosely based on a couple of friends of mine who who live uh in vienna now um i i don't know what was going through my head i i had been reading a lot of hannah arendt i had been thinking about um modes of alienation uh, Brecht's Conversations in Exile. I mean, it's a long time ago that I wrote that song, mm. probably about 10 years ago. Um, and it's on a record of mine called Lost Causes. Um, I think, yeah, and, 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 and in the years since then, in certain parts of it have thankfully become uh, obsolete. You know, the fact that someone would have to leave the United States in order to um, have a same-sex marriage has thankfully changed. And uh, I just sing it the old way because I didn't want to rewrite it. But, um, um, you know, <laughs> these things have a way of changing overnight. You know, uh, we, we see that now, how, how fragile um, institutions that we take for granted are um, uh, facing the, the growing uh, uh, tide of, of, of a kind of proto-fascism, a kind of populist ethno-nationalism, um, which is, uh, is ironically a global, this kind of ethno-nationalism is a global phenomenon right now. Um, it's a historical phenomenon. And songs that my band and I were recording 10, 15 years ago about these issues um, have gotten so relevant that it's almost it, it's all, to perform them is almost redundant, <laughs> and I find well, myself wanting to perform other things. Well, it's funny is like aside from at the line that you alluded to where you did, you didn't want to change it, that song could have been written yesterday. It really I, I you know it felt felt like it really it, it hit on so many very very um, very contemporary is, issues even if this was written ten or fifteen years ago. Well, th thank you. I think. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, 
Yeah, I know that that's kind of a mixed bag of a compliment, but I, I hope you understand that, you know, sure. when, when a song can speak to universality like that. Well, let me let me let me do another song that's sure. explicitly about universality. If we have time for it, I'll try to drive through it a little bit. Um, because this uh, this uh, I'm seeing just some of the comments people are writing. It's great, great comments here. I wish I had time to like address all of them. Unfortunately, my songs are too long. Um, <laughs> the the uh, so it, with inner immigration, there there is certainly a sense of uh, the ways in which these predicaments of belonging and alienation are thoroughly baked into one's historical predicament one's moment, one's fit, class and geographic location. And these modes of Jewishness, these historical Jewish identities are filtered through those experiences. Um, and I wanted to create a piece that was so outside of that. You talk about universal, you use the word universal. So this is a song which I created somewhat ironically um, in the context of a theater production 10, 12, 11 years ago um, that was to be the, the testament of a f false Jewish messiah from Detroit uh, who left this, this testament of universal diasporism, the universal diaspora testament. Uh, and his name was Adam Spielman. Uh, in this play. So I wrote this for him and uh, then I recorded it in Israel the next year and that recording just came out. The duo that I have with Psoy, it's not the international, it's the international with a U, like the undernational. Um, that's our duo and we have three albums, the first international, the third international, and the fourth international. And this is on the fourth international, which just came out last uh fall even though I recorded it over 10 years ago. Oh, I need the F, excuse me. So I'll drive through this one and see if we, we're all still here on the other side. All you drunken shiksa sweethearts with your bloodshot eyes of blue. All you border crossing feglich who've been quarantined for flu. You lost exilic aliens, you migrant mongrel stew. You needn't feel verloren, you don't have to be blue. Just climb aboard this ark of ours and join the soggy crew. It's a diasporic politics, it's a reconstructed you. With permeable borders in between the old and new. It's a way to hide away what they would take away from you. Forget your God and country and your revolution too. It's possible for you to leave the many for the few. It don't matter if your daddy is from Poland or Peru. Your blood might come from Turkey or Detroit or Timbuktu. Your language could be Farsi, Sanskrit, German or Zulu. Though it wouldn't hurt to learn a word of Yiddish, Efshek too. Come on, we've got some wandering to do. So bring out your Jew, bring out your Jew. You may have a Jew inside of you. A Jew, a Jew, a secret little Jew. A secret Jew is buried inside you. Well, my definition here could use some explanation, true. You have to ask yourself just what I mean when I say Jew. Well, the Jewishness concerning us should not be misconstrued. Blood and land are things with which it doesn't have to do. Religion is a matter most relevant here, too. I talk about a kind of other hiding inside you, but I mean it as a question, not an answer to your blues. The question is the answer, and the question is a Jew. So let us try to look at this anew to find a category underneath the ones we knew, a mercurial identity for people who are strewn in countries far and wide who haven't got a home in view, who schlep around like shackles all the roots from which they grew. Well, others have endured this kind of endless gullis too, and here I offer it all up to you. 
It's a kind of kosher food for thought that Goyim now can chew. It's what they did with Jesus when they wrote the Bible new. They rebranded monotheism for wider public view. So learn to take the rootless cosmopolitan worldview in the hidden interstices we all normally eschew. To schlep your gullus proudly, you must learn how to make do. And learn, learn, learn is what the wise man tells us too. So learn to be a Jew, learn to be a Jew, an inner kind of migratory Jew. It's true, it's true, a secret little Jew is wandering around inside of you. But why put all my emphasis on secret inner Jews? We all have different nations that we wear like different shoes. They carry us around so that our feet don't get too bruised. It may seem to be easier just to go out in the nude, to throw up our identities like half-digested food. Yes, maybe it's reductive what I'm trying to pursue. It's highly problematic. It'll probably confuse. It's philosemitism in a cheap semantic ruse. And I mean, what about the people who are actually Jews with traumas all my deconstructed theories can't subdue? Well, perhaps you haven't seen one since the end of World War II. Yes, something here is missing, an historic residue. Well, just ask a gentle German for a history review. She'll tell you how they marked us with numerical tattoos. They turned us into ashes, hair, and lamps, and soap, and glue. And no, it wasn't something that I personally knew, but they taught me all about it in my temple Sunday school, and I guess it kind of left me with some hang-ups and taboos. How can I wear the mantle of the martyred ghetto Jews? I grew up in a state where fate was something I could choose. While all around me people were exploited and abused, my privileges were never noticed, they were only used. And, and who wouldn't want to win when all we'd ever done was lose? If victimhood was part of what it meant to be the Jews, then security was a kind of offer we could not refuse. But did it really work to try to make a new Hebrew? With the enemies we slew, the hatred grew and grew. But the thing you hate in others is the thing you hate in you. And where it all went wrong, nobody knew. Now exile may return like deja vu. And we will have to learn it all anew. To learn to be a Jew, learn to be a Jew, learn to be a Jew among the Jews. It's true, it's true, the problem isn't new. A homeless Jew is hiding inside you. Well, the hour is getting late, and soon we'll have to pay our dues. You can read it in the papers, you can see it in the news. We're faced with situations where we all will have to choose, and no one will recover what we're all about to lose. The world is turning colder, and the, the, sky, the walls are high and true. The cities all are burning into something dark and new, and all the skies are turning to a bloody crimson hue. The fire and the waste have beat the heavens black and blue. And you're living in a land and time that aren't made for you. You're refugees from wars between the religious, religious points of view and all the broken borders of the names they put on you. But history is a river full of things that you can use. So when they ask you for your papers and you don't know what to do, remember in this moment what you're carrying with you. Because the day will come when all your papers are refused and then you'll find yourself in exile too. Well, I have a little prophecy for you. An apocalyptic mystery, a clue. As the world becomes like Babylon, we all become like Jews. When Zion may be dead and gone, the promise may come true. Babylon is everywhere, and Zion is in you. So learn to take it with you. Learn to be a Jew. But a Jew can be American or Syrian or Druze. So if you have a better name that you would like to use, well, I'd love to hear the testament of you. The imaginary diasporic messianic you, the broken and neurotic post-apocalyptic you. This isn't just the dream of us, this is the dream of you. And there's only one Messiah, and she's buried inside you. So bring her out and show the world what we all need to do, and forgive the self-indulgence that I spew. And I just wrote this goddamn thing where every sentence rhymes with Jew.
Wow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That so, one that one is conquering a beast. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't think of any other rhymes. There was an earlier version with the word poo in it, but I got rid of that. <laughs> well, for what it's worth, it, it really is truly fantastic. I think I'm probably speaking for just about everybody on this call when I say that one is astonishing. And, Don't uh, speak for anyone besides yourself. I've yeah, been exactly. Because of that song. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm I, for anyone that I offended that is currently on the Zoom call. I'm sorry. It speaks to me, and I love it. And I just love hearing you do it. So thank you so much. Uh, the question, the title of the song, it is the Jew in you, and there is a fabulous video of it uh, also on YouTube. Check it out. Uh, very easy to find. Daniel Kahn, the Jew in you. Um, so. I can't believe that we have gone through 50 minutes. This is insane. Uh, I've just been loving it. <laughs> so I, I would say let's now would be a great time to open it up for some questions and then maybe we close with one more song afterward. Sounds good. Fabulous. And I will also say I, there have been so many wonderful questions coming in through the chat. If we don't get to your question, I apologize sincerely ahead of time. There are so many of you and we want everyone to get a chance to ask your questions. We can't get everyone. Um, so go ahead and feel free to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand by using the reactions button and you can ask directly. Um, so here's a question from uh, Tegan Roberts. Um, okay. Is there a reason for no second international? Also, I thought the video for the song was really interesting. I'm wondering how the setting was chosen and whether there is any significance to the ghost name tag on your vest. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Um, I have nothing to say about the Second International. Uh, it, it's not that it doesn't exist. I'm just not going to talk about it. Um, the ghost, uh, yeah, there's a great place uh, in Eastern Market in Detroit called Cheap Charlie's uh, right off of Gratiot. And you can go in there and buy used uh, factory uniforms, shirts, pants, and overalls. And that, it, Soy and I, Pasha and I were in Detroit and we bought coveralls for our international project. I love that. It's like a mechanics coverall and uh, it's super comfy. And uh, it belonged to a guy whose name in whatever, I think in, he worked at a Dearborn uh, auto parts factory. Um, his name was Ghost. <laughs> That's fantastic. Know. All right. That not exactly where I expected to go, but I love it. Um, all right. A question from Pasha says Carl. So maybe there's a Marxist thing going on. <laughs> um, I see Erica, Erica's hand raised. So I will ask you to unmute and then Erica, you may ask your question. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm, uh, I had posted much earlier in the chat, so probably got um, over, overlooked. So I'm interested to know, Daniel, uh, if you are familiar with the musical Ghetto, and um, because I think that would be such an incredible production to bring to the States, either in translation or with super titles. Nowadays, people are used to that because it, it really melds this whole concept with the German and the Yiddish and the klezmer, the Yiddish music. And anyway, it's just a... Uh, a wonderful uh, theatrical piece. I was curious, and has that ever been revived in Germany? Because I saw it when it was there in like 1980 something, five, four. Um, yeah, that's, so that's an excellent Before you question. were born, probably. No, I was, I was, I was around. I just wasn't over there, and I didn't know. I wouldn't have known what was happening. Um, uh, that you're talking, you're talking about a play by Joshua Sobel, a wonderful yeah. uh, Israeli playwright, um, yeah. about the Vilna Ghetto. It's, it's a powerful piece of theater. Um, yeah. my dear friend and teacher and mentor and colleague Al Alan Byrne. Um, did the music for a couple of productions of it here in Germany. Um, one of them, I believe, at the Gorky Theater, where I, I've worked mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and uh, I can say I know that it gets produced uh, periodically around Germany, at least. It's known play. It's in the repertoire. Yeah. Um, it's done in Israel. I actually, I don't know if it's done in Israel anymore. I remember it was well, very... I, why hasn't it ever been brought? I mean, I just... It's... This is not it a was, it was larger was, group, but it's just an interesting, I was just curious about whether you were familiar and, you know. Um, there, I do know that there was a, a big New York production of it at Circle in the Square when it was written uh, or some years afterwards. And I, I think it didn't last long. I think it definitely is worth revisiting. I think it's a powerful piece. Um, I think the idea of doing it actually in Yiddish is a really, really 
good idea. I would love to see that happen. And if anyone has the idea to make that happen, please call me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Um, I see Kenneth Perez, or, or per forgive me if I mispronounce the name. Um, I will ask you to unmute. Yeah, hi, and thanks for doing this, and Lori for producing and directing. Daniel, you're great. I was wondering if you experienced any pushback from establishment, you know, establishment Jews and pro Israel occupation groups since you're so critical and um, in a good sense. Uh, well, th thanks. Thanks for the qualification there. Uh, um, I, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I would, I mean, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't seek conflict. I seek solidarity, and I and I think that I, my music speaks positively to the people whom I would want it to speak to. I don't go. I'm not. I don't. I'm not interested in unproductive uh, modes of performative conflict. I'm not interested in offending people. I am interested in a kind of productive uh, provocation that can happen. I think that provoking questioning uh, is a positive thing. Um, but yeah, sure. I mean, there's all kinds of gigs that I don't get. There are gigs that I've lost. There are audience members I've lost. There are arguments I've gotten into. I've, sure, you know, but I, I think um, I'd probably be doing something wrong if that weren't the case. Um, thank you. Uh, and then let's see, is there anyone, let's see. Um, I see a question about uh, how much the Russian immigration scene has contributed to Berlin's Jewish music scene? Uh, uh, it wouldn't be the same scene at all were it not. I mean, at least, I mean, in general, yes, but also for me, I mean, I, my collaborations with Yuri Gorgi, with, um, uh, with, with Soy Korolenko, Vanya Zhuk, uh, Sveta Kundish, Sasha Luria, Ilya Schneeves, um, and you know, most importantly, my my family and my life and my collaboration and work with Yeva Lapsker um, uh, is, I mean, that that has really defined that encounter, that cultural encounter has really defined my my work here in Berlin. I, I uh, and I've started. I, I have a whole project um, of having translated the Russian songs of Bulata Kujava um, into English. I have a whole album of that, um, and uh, I work all the time with with Yeva on translation projects and theater projects and music projects and um, I am proud to be now married into a, um, a Soviet Jewish family so Mazal tov. Yeah. Um, well unfortunately I know there are more questions coming in but we have reached the 10 o'clock mark 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time and we keep this to an hour so with that um, we have one more song Daniel uh, I apologize for not getting all of the videos, or sorry, I apologize for not getting to all the questions. Uh, if there are any further questions, uh, please do, uh, you know, please feel free to keep them in the, put them in the chat and we can always save the chat for later. Um, and with that, thank you so much. So uh, I guess I'll, I wanted to include uh, one translation into Yiddish and this is a song which uh, I what I'd like to say about it is that it was a Yiddish song um, before it was written in English uh, originally um, and some years ago when the idea of, of translating this song into Yiddish was brought to me um, I really tried to think of it like a reverse translation, like trying to uncover the Yiddish original. It's uh, deeply Jewish in its, in its imagery, uh, which hasn't prevented it from becoming, uh, ironically, a kind of um, uh, schmaltzy uh, Christmas favorite for all kinds of uh, singers all over the world. And uh, I, I always kind of felt Maybe people shouldn't sing this song anymore, but I enjoy singing it, and and uh, it's a good way to end this stuff here, this these this collection of songs that I did tonight, because I think it brings us back to something that's a little more spiritual, a little more rooted in in the liturgy, and 
I say this as a committed secularist, but uh, the song calls for it. So um, I wish everyone, um, uh, you know, gesinth und und koyich, you know, health and power in this time. And I want to thank Lori for all of the amazing questions and for uh, for bringing me into this. And uh, again, Neil Michaels and and and, uh, and all of you for your wonderful uh, questions and your 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 uh, thoughtful comments. And uh, I have I haven't seen anything that was really aggressive or unthoughtful or in the comments. But if that was there, I want to thank you for that too. Uh, um, but yeah, so this is a. This is uh... Gewena nigen via sol Us do vidl gespielt Far god nor dir Vods nisch gewen As a yeshue Singt a zoi, a fa, a so, a mische berg hebt a ko, der duler me lach we. Deine Munde ist geworden schwach, Bascheve bot sich auf dem Dach, ihr Gein und die Livone, dein Refue. Sie nimmt dein Guff, sie nimmt dein Kopf, sie schneit von deinem Hohr, a zop und zieht von Moel a Rob, a Halleluja. O Teire, ich kenn dein Stil, ich bin geschlafen auf dein Deal, ich hab kein Mal nicht gewebt, gelebt mit der Satznur. Und ich seh dein Schloss, ich seh dein Fon. A Harz ist nicht kein mehliches Thron. Es ist a kalte und a kalte Halleluja. Und wie am Alto sog mir euch, wo es tut sich dort in dein Schoiß, du wusch darfst sich schämen wie Absurde. Gedenk, wie ich ob in dir geruht, wie die Schiene glut in unser Blut und jeder Rote im Tod. Halleluja. Sein mein Gott ist gar nicht da und Liebe soll sein kaum im Rau abpuster träum zerbrochen und mich hole nicht kein Gewein in Mitternacht nicht kein bald Schuhe aufgewacht nur an Elende Kolkeure Halleluja Apikoiris rufst du mich, mit Schem Hawaii lässt er ich, nur meile ich, der war nicht kein Geule. Nur es brennt sich heiß in jeden Oss, von Aleph Beis, Gor bis in Sof, die Heilige und Kalle, Halleluja. Und das ist alles. Es ist nicht kein Sach, ich mach derweil, was ich mach. Ich komm da wie ein Mensch, nicht kein Schluhe. Ich hab's alles verloren, sei wie sei. Will ich verloren, nadeu, nein. Und schreien, will ich heim. Halleluja.
Seid ihr gesund und stark? Was? Schön im Dank. Wow. Um, well, with that, on, on behalf of everyone in this Zoom room, herzlich und schön im Dank. Um, that is an amazing way to, uh, to move into the week. Um, and with that, just on, on behalf of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, Temple Israel, UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, and all of us who just love this music, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you that, so much. And with I that, hope it's we can a, see each other in person. <laughs> uh, merci Hashem. And with that, an op this is, it's always a rare opportunity for this, us these days as musicians to hear an actual applause. So I will unmute you, feel free to, uh, to actually uh, give Daniel uh, the applause he deserves. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.